Hi, folks. This is Ken Ween, and this is It Matters Radio, and I'm here today with my wonderful co-host, Monica Brinkman. Hi, Ken. <laughs> Monica. And our guest this evening <clears throat> is Steve Lindahl. Steve has been on the show before because he's a prolific author. <laughs> and we've talked about a few of his books over time. This evening, we're talking about this book. I always love it when I have a print copy because I can hold it up for you folks to see. <laughs> but I'm going to read the title. I love the graphics, yeah. <laughs> Living in a Star's Light. And the star in this case, no, no, we're not talking about the sun or <laughs> some of the, you know, sci-fi sun up there. We're talking about a human star, uh, Miss Lotta Crabtree. And by the way, it, um, Miss Lotta Crabtree is the right way to refer to her, you know, because she was a star during the 19th century. Correct. Uh, started out in the gold fields of California, ended up, she went to Europe for a while, she was in New York, she was in one of those really world famous at the time stars. She started out as a child started hoofing it, dancing, and then went on and performed in, in plays and things, and was a really brilliant figure in the theater of her time. Uh, and this is a novel, it's a, what you'd call an, a biographical novel. Now, okay, so this is taking place during the Victorian era. Of course, we're in the United States, so Victoria wasn't the queen here, but it is the Victorian era. And one of the things that I know about London during Queen Victoria's reign is that approximately 50% of the women <clears throat> living in London earned their way as prostitutes. Yes. And so this is a novel while it is, yes, it is about uh, a star, and no, she was not a prostitute. She did do some burlesque, which in some people's mind might equal that, but really, no, she was not. But she was surrounded by. And I wanted to start out by asking Steve, you know, what do you think the women in this novel, the, the women, not Loretta or her mother, but the other women in this novel, what do they tell us about today? What can we walk away from living in a star's light, thinking about what's going on with women in the world? Ooh. Well, um, like, like you say, um, this in San Francisco in the mid 19th century uh, was largely men, most mostly men were out there and of the women that came out it was close to 80 percent were sex workers um then there were people like lotta crabtree and her mother marianne crabtree um they ran a boarding house for a while there were people who set up um uh restaurants little makeshift restaurants and a few things like that so women had some other ways they could make a living but because there were so many men and they didn't bring their wives with them most of the time, it was a very uh, a, attractive place for people who wanted to earn a living um, or, had to, or yeah, had to earn a living uh, as a sex worker. Um, Mary Ann Crabtree uh, relates, I think, that's Lotta Crabtree's mother. Mm -hmm. She's like the ultimate stage mother. She was the one who kept pushing Lotta. She really wanted Lotta on stage. She discovered she could make lots of money through Lotta. Um, Lotta had two brothers. The brothers went off to boarding school while Lotta and her mother were doing the tours. Um, and I think she was very much a feminist, if it's possible to be a feminist in the uh, mid 19th century. So I, I kind of liked that aspect of what it could say about women today. Her husband, 
who actually went from New York to San Francisco a couple years before they went, he flopped at just about everything he tried to do. Yeah. And then yeah. and then Marianne brought her daughter out and like I said, ran a successful boarding house. You know, the Crabtrees is an example of, of where <laughs> the man didn't bring, did bring his wife. He brought his wife, but, but you know, left her <laughs> and left her to, to survive and didn't return in the scene until there was some money to come and get. Um, right. Yeah. So this is really, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is a story about a very strong woman. But now there's also another woman back when they get to New York. There's a landlady. <laughs> right. And she's been a sex worker. Yes. I mean, there was, um, there were definitely issues like that in the 19th century in New York too, in any big city. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, San Francisco was, um, was more so. Uh, yeah, more so, <laughs> extreme, let's say. The thing that strikes yeah. me is that among these women who have been uh, sex workers, and there are a few of them in the story, and that they all strive to get out of the life, make careers for themselves, uh, marry in some instances. Uh, the one who is the landlady also owns a, a bakery. Bakery, and right. One of the messages here uh, that I took away from the book was if we stop stigmatizing women who do sex work, and look at how where they're coming from and how they're surviving. That often uh, they're pretty impressive people. There's there's no doubt about that. Um, one of the sex workers in San Francisco that is mentioned in the book but has a very minor part is a Chinese woman named Ah Toy and she was a historical figure. She, um, she came from China to uh, America and along the way her husband died. Mm -hmm. And the only way she could survive the trip was becoming a sex worker. And she discovered she could make quite a lot of money doing that. Um, and after she reached San Francisco, she continued in that trade and eventually became a madam and became an extremely wealthy woman with brothels in San Francisco and in Sa Sacramento as well. Um, she, you know, she had sort of mixed morals, I guess, because some of her women were brought over from China against their will. But once they were over here, she protected them from some of the more violent people that were involved in the same trade. And I found her an extremely interesting character. The, the society in San Francisco at the time was very based on wealth. So that, you know, a woman like Ah Toy, who had made quite a lot of money, and even though she was Chinese, which at the time there was a lot of bigotry against the Chinese uh, at that time. Um, but even so, she was accepted into society because she had done so well financially. And they didn't Same. care how she made her money just so she had the money. No, not really. <laughs> they didn't. I, think, I think that if you think about how some of the people in this country have made their money, you know, they may not have been sex workers, but some of them have been pretty scuzzy. Yeah. Right. And uh, we tend to not care about that in this country. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, if, if you've ever read uh, uh, Edward Rutherford's New York um, uh, book, and it talks about these families growing up in New York over uh, historical, long history, long period of history, uh, and a lot of the money was made from slave trade. Right. And I grew up in the New York area and did not realize the connection that uh, New York had. I knew there was a connection up in Boston, but there definitely was a connection in New York too, to the slave trade. So there's been a lot of, you know. And especially, especially in, uh, by the way, in Rhode Island, huge connection to the slave trade. Right. Was made in that. Right. 
And, um, you know, I, I remember watching one of the presidential debates, one of the primary debates, and one of the candidates, I think it was Marianne Williamson. Um, I'm thinking I got her name right. Um, but anyway, she made the point that when she was talking about reparations, she made the point that if you looked at the last slave trip, a boat that came over to America, the descendants of the owners of that boat were all very wealthy families, whereas the descendants of the slaves that were transported over were all still living in poverty. So there was, you know, there's, there's kind of a historical ramifications over the years. We value money. We don't value human humanity, but what Lotta of Crabtree did, which is another very interesting thing about yes. it. She actually, she ended up a very wealthy woman. Uh, had, tragically, her career, or uh, maybe not so tragically, because her career was cut short, I think, at a point where she was really ready to give it up. She had a, a, yeah. an accident where somebody failed to catch her in a fall, and uh, she ended up hurting her back. and gave up the stage, but she, she was still quite wealthy, had a, had a few pieces of property, had invested in racehorses. Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and one of the things I found very interesting about her was that she used her money to do good. Right. She, she you know, if you looked up Wikipedia and Lotta Crabtree, I believe she's in, she's listed as an actress and a philanthropist. So uh, she definitely did some good along the way. Sometimes she had some self-interest in there too. Um, she supported um, the Newsies, I believe they were called, which were these young boys, often homeless, who made their living selling newspapers. Yeah. Well, she said she put a lot of her money into making sure they were taken care of and fed and all of those things that are necessities. And then in re return, they showed up at a lot of her shows and made sure they were cheering loudly. <laughs> and yeah. So she had her, her like little entourage, I guess, of news. She was a wise <laughs> woman. <laughs> it might have also perhaps chosen which headline uh, to push. Oh, yeah, which, that's which, uh, which make a newspaper to, to hawk more, a little more right. Light. Which 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 headline to scream about on the street? <laughs> You're right. And it's like, you know, it's like Twitter. You know, the more you get mentioned on Twitter, the more people are aware of you. Right. So, same thing. You know, in those days, you have all these kids out there, and if they're all yelling, "Lot of Crabtree." Smashes records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So okay. yeah, so she and her mother knew how how to handle a lot of those things. Yeah, Lotta was the the wealthiest actress at the time. I think they're like Edwin Booth and some of the other actors at the time might have made more money off the stage, but that was only a minor part of her fortune. Marianne was extremely brilliant when it came to real estate investment and a few other things. So it's, the money didn't just sit. It it it. And so when Lotta died, she had a, a lot of <laughs> a lot of money to offer. And there are still some, I believe it's small farms that are being um, supported with a, a lot of Crabtree grant that's still in existence all these years later. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing, it really is. Yeah. One, one of the reasons that this money was out there, folks, is she had two brothers, one died, he, mm -hmm. he was rather troubled. You're right. One inherited part of the estate, and the rest of it, she did not have children. She did not, never marry. Again, the Miss Lotta Crabtree. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the things that you bring up about, because we've been talking a lot about sex workers, sex roles, feminism, is one of the things you mentioned throughout the novel, almost as a motif, is her preference for dressing in male clothes. Now, anybody yes. who looks back at the women's clothes of that time and what it was in, what a woman had to endure to get dressed, 
can certainly appreciate the <laughs> simple motive. <clears throat> but one of the questions I, I was wondering about, do we know anything about Lada Crabtree having a love life? The, she did, she had, uh, there was a, a Russian count who she was with for a while. There were some, a couple of different men who would wait outside the stage door until she came out, until they finally met her and, and tried to, um, and dated her for a while. Um, but she, her mother, who was, like I've said often, a very strong woman, was also very strong when it came to mothering her. And she had her own ideas about what type of <coughs> man Lotta should be with. And so there was a conflict there. And I think that sometimes got in the way of some of her relationships. She never had one that settled into a marriage. She, she was very close to her mother though, um, extremely close. And in, I think in terms of like Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher, mm -hmm. that type of a, of a relationship where those two not only were mother and daughter, but they were also best friends. And Carrie Fisher, of course, died just a very short time after Debbie Reynolds. Well, that didn't happen a lot. Debbie of Debbie Reynolds died shortly after Carrie, yeah. Is that how it went? I thought Debbie Reynolds well, died. first her daughter died. In fact, she was with her uh, son and she had said that she wanted to die. You know, and he said, Ma, don't start, you know. And then she died the next day after yeah. Carrie. But it was, they were so close yes. that they, you know, it was an emotional, <clears throat> like died of heartbreak, basically. Yeah. Or, I you think know. so, too. It sure well, seemed with, like it. With Lotta Crabtree, her mother died and she no longer was comfortable in the mansion she built in Northern Jersey on the lake. And that's when she moved to, to be up with her brother, um, Ash, who was up in Massachusetts. So um, she lost that companionship and had to strive for another one. Yeah, actually one of the fascinating <clears throat> things about the, the fictional part of this book is about Lada's loneliness. Yes. And her searching for connection and friendship. <clears throat> and the other major characters in the book, the fictional characters, are the friends that she found along the way <clears throat> and their devotion to her. Right. Uh, when when I write historical fiction like this, I try to be as true as possible uh, to all the facts that I know of Lotta Crabtree's life. I don't want to write something that somebody's going to look at and say, oh, that didn't happen. And when I list the plays, I want to be the actual plays that she was in, things like that. But you there are no sources that say Lotta was lonely or Lotta wasn't lonely. So to build a full character, I have to kind of visualize what I think Lotta Crabtree was going through. And I saw what is common, or at least I hear what is common among some celebrities, that there is a sense of loneliness because you've got this great career, but your personal life sometimes doesn't match that. And I think Lotta went through that to some extent. As for the characters she played on stage, she played both men and women. She was very short and she played young characters throughout her whole life. But her, her male characters, she, she started wearing men's clothing I think because she kept in their costumes afterwards, she found them more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But she also smoked cigars, which mm -hmm. wasn't exactly a feminine thing to do in the middle of the 19th century. But mm -hmm. there was no indication that she was um, sexually drawn to women or anything like that. She was, all of her partners that are listed in any of the biographies I used for research were all men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but she was, uh, she was, I guess, you know, she wanted to be free. Just like, I think she inherited that from her mother. She was a strong woman and wanted to be free. And this is the way she wanted to look. And 
So that's the way she was going to look. She had enough money to be able to do it. Huh? <laughs> yes, that's true too. <laughs> now, folks, a lot of, Steve, didn't a lot of people look down at entertainers back then though, compared to how they're idolized in our world? Uh, yeah, it probably, it, it probably depends on the entertainer. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Edwin Booth certainly had a, a great reputation and um, they made the gossip columns. When, when Lotta Crabtree went overseas, she was listed in the papers as, you know, going to be on this particular ship and traveling. So, uh, you know, I, I think, and, and for example, the hotel that was near them, the Breslin Hotel that was on Lake Apacon, mm -hmm. um, that area was being developed by Breslin and Lotta Crabtree wanted to build her mansion right near there. So I think that they might have gotten a very good deal on it financially because he gets a hotel where there's a celebrity living right next door. And it's like, you know, you might look down on some actor, but if you have a chance to, to you know, look out the window of your hotel room and, and see him standing out there, it's going to be an, an attraction to, well, to draw you I to them. I just find it fascinating that there were women that were able to, you know, get to the heights that she did, to the wealth that she yes. did back in those days. Because yeah, you know, women right are right. kind of under man's thumb for a long, long time. <laughs> Well, that's right. one of the reasons I like this book, because it is such a feminist story set in a time when, and, and I have to say, Steve, that the men, for the most part, except for this one young, this one guy, Walter, he starts out as a kid and he matures, but the, the other men in the story really don't amount to much. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> I mean, he, to begin with, the, the, he starts as boy Walter. He starts out, and he and his best friend and their fathers are partners. And the Walter's father is really a, a not a particularly good human being. Correct. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, by and large. I mean, the best thing the father does is he takes Walter to, to visit his first prostitute, who happens <laughs> luckily to end up being a very a very decent, kind, and, and insightful woman who helps him to grow up. But other than I mean, even Lauda's brothers, I mean, what, the one who died, um, he, he was pretty much a disaster. You know, yeah. Right, he, he had his problems. And he had two major tragedies. Of course, the second one was his death. But the first one, like I said, uh, Marianne Crabtree put her sons in boarding schools while she was touring around with her daughter. Yes. And yeah. George apparently was not very happy and he ran away from one. He tried to hop on a, a train and had a, a problem getting into the freight car, fell under and lost a leg. Uh, by getting run over by the wheels so he was he was suffering with that and then eventually later on died from something unrelated and then his father her father was certainly a, he was an alcoholic and a, right yeah he was he was like so really and then the a lot of the other men uh busy abusing the the street the uh, sex workers uh there's one guy he, he's a basically a pimp and right. you pay him enough well you're you can beat the girl up right basically i, 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 mean, I wanted to yeah. show a, a picture of two different kinds of, of brothels one was in the saloon where rue who is one of the characters and tabby who's another one where they were uh working as sex workers um but the owner was a fairly decent guy and treated them well um, but then her contract was sold to this other man and he was the picture of, you know, the violent domineering yeah. pimp. And men in general don't look very good, but now you've just raised another topic and, you know, this is, okay, we think sex workers, you know, contracts, 
What's that about? Well, there uh, there were contracts for for the sex workers. Um, I you know I th a lot of that was racially based, and I think I mentioned that in the book too. So that they um, they did. I don't think they had contracts for the Native Americans and for the Mexicans, but the um, the European prostitutes would have a contract and so you were legally bound to be working in the sex trade for whatever length of time that said. And often that money, I mean, what, what did they get in return? That money was often paid to somebody back home. Mom and, mom and dad were in trouble or, or dad had died, mom was in trouble. And, and basically these young women were being sold into it's yeah, it's human trafficking. Yeah. yeah. Which has been going on forever. Yes. But you know, I can see why you pictured the men in this manner because back in that day, when they drank like crazy. Right. Um, they ordered the women around, you know. Right. I think the woman maybe was head of the kitchen. <laughs> and no, right. No, yeah. only the kitchen at home. Not not a kitchen like at the hotel or something no. like that. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Just at home, exactly, waiting right. on everyone. So yes, like, like I said, some of the women opened their own little makeshift um, uh, tables, basically, right. and yeah. served food outside of their homes to make some extra money. The but if you were in a hotel, it, your chef was going to be male. Yeah. Actually, you know, if you go onto the Native American reservations here in this country now, you'll find homes in which uh, that kind of pop-up home-based restaurant, and of course, because they're on the reservation, they're, they're not covered by the, and some of them, oh my God, the food is wonderful. <laughs> right. <laughs> I bet you. Yeah. Um, Dash, you know, um, I, I could talk to you for you know, hours probably, Steve, about this because it you touch on many, many subject matters and topics in the book, and people should get this, they should read it. But I think it's time for us to just take a peek at something else you did because Steve not only wrote this book, which I hope you buy. Okay, can you show that one more time if you have a yeah, of course, it's called Living in a Star's Light. And it's got a great picture, by the way, of uh, Lotta Crabtree. She's cute, huh? <laughs> she, she's a very nice looking, you know, oh, kind of, thanks. this one, a very demure looking. I mean, whoever took this photograph knew what they were doing. And of course, that's back in the days when photography was just beginning, but it's really a great picture. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. But oh, by the way, I I mentioned, the but, th oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I should mention, <laughs> by the way, folks, on the back, there are uh, resources and you know websites you can do some reading at and such i mean steve lindahl who we're talking to today who wrote this book he, he does serious research before he puts together a book and i'm sorry monica i interrupted you oh, no, i was just saying that um i hope people will check out the links that you just mentioned. And Steve, um, please keep in touch with us. Let us know what's going on in your life. But I think this yeah. is the time that we can give them another little glimpse into another book that you wrote. And it's called Under a Warped Cross. And we're gonna play yeah. it right now. Thanks guys. We'll see you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Here we go. This is a reading from my novel, Under a Warped Cross. This section is about midway through the book. It's a reflection back on the early years in the life of one of my main characters. Chapter 17, Jolenta, years earlier when she was a child. May I speak, Jolenta asked, her voice cracking. Her mother was sitting on a stool with an infant pressed to her chest. Of course, Coventina told her, but make it short. You need to prepare dinner soon. Jolenta nodded, then looked at the feeding infant. All she could see was the back of the baby's head. Is this a new girl, she asked. He's a boy. Clean the hearth before you cook. We're lucky you haven't burned down the house, leaving so many ashes. Yes, ma'am, 
Jolenta didn't know much about the babies. She had never asked their names. Instead, she referred to them by descriptions like the new one, the fat one, or the smelly one. She hated how they took all her mom's time. Jolenta was 10 years old, old enough to understand that her mother had to make a living. Still, the girl didn't like having to do so many chores. She did the cleaning, cooking, sewing, and most of the weaving. He's here to replace the one who died. Coventina spoke as she set the new one on the carpet where the other three were resting. She picked up one of the others, a girl this time, and started feeding her. It's time I explained why the infants are here. I already know, Jolenta told her mother. The church makes you do it. Coventina shifted the baby to her other breast, then patted the child gently on her back. But what you don't know is that your father is a priest, which is why he couldn't marry me. Instead, he offered me a chance to make a living wage while helping other women who were in the same situation. It wasn't what I wanted to do. I had experience harvesting wheat, tending to livestock, and weaving blankets. But no matter how I pleaded my case, I couldn't convince any of the farmers I could work efficiently with an infant in my arms. If I had owned land, I could have started my own farm. But without money, that dream was like wishing to be the queen. So your father suggested I work as a parish wet nurse, which sounded easy at first. What I didn't understand was that I had to take in charges, three at a time, all who needed my milk as much as you did. When you were old enough for solid food, the number went up to four. This was something new, Jolenta thought, something her mother had never told her. She lifted her head and stared. There's been little time in my life for anything other than tending to babies. I have to feed them, of course, but I'm also in charge of keeping them clean, safe, and well-rested. Each time one infant is weaned, the church brings another, but I never complain. That last statement was a lie. Jolenta's mom complained all the time. Coventina narrowed her eyes as if she knew what her daughter was thinking, but she continued. The priests keep most of the money the parents pay, but we get some and get to stay in this house. I treat the children well, and only two of them have died, one a couple of years ago, and you know about the recent one. I guess my milk is good. Sometimes I feel like a milk goat, but you and I are secure. As long as I don't dry up, I can be a wet nurse for years. Jolenta nodded, but shivered at the idea of living a life like her mom's. She turned and walked to the doorway. Something had to change. She stepped outside. It was a warm spring day. The sun shone through a cloudless sky and a soft breeze blew through the trees and bushes surrounding their home. The wind rustled the leaves like God was whispering to Jolenta, saying, follow me. She walked into the woods beside her house and kept going until she could no longer see her home. Jolenta reached her perfect place to sit and think, a fallen fir with an area on its wide trunk clear of branches. This time she was sharing the tree with a lark perched on one of the remaining branches, calling with three chirps, one long and two short bursts. He rested a moment and began his call again. The bird turned around, looking for a mate, but remained alone, like she was. I'm so tired, she said, talking to the lark. I don't ever want to go back to that life, ever. Yet my mother needs me, and I need her. A priest is my father, and only she knows his name. The breeze picked up, rustling the leaves in the hardwoods around Jolenta. She thought she heard a small animal. When she turned, she couldn't find anything moving. Dinner will be late, she told the lark, and mother will not be happy. Coventina often said she had to eat well and on schedule to keep her milk pure. Jolenta wasn't certain that was true, but she tried to keep her mother happy. Goodbye, bird, she said as she stood. I'd better go home. When Jolenta entered the house, she expected her mother to yell. Scolding was Coventina's first response when Jolenta veered at all from the normal routine. Yet the only noise she heard was the sound of babies crying. Her mother was still sitting on her stool, but slouched over. She didn't look up to see Jolenta. The babies were laid out on the floor, on a carpet Jolenta had woven, with a raw wool color behind a pattern of black. It was an odd place for infants to be, since they had cradles. Jolenta walked to them, picked up the child who was crying loudest, and tried to console her. The baby stopped making noise as she turned her head and tried to suckle from Jolenta, who was too young to have breasts, much less milk. The other three babies were crying now, filling the small house with a shrill noise that made the girl nervous. She stepped toward her mother and shook her shoulder. Coventina fell forward, landing on her head, then rolling to her side and staring at Jolenta. Her eyes were open, but without the light of her spirit. 
M -m mother she whispered, her voice bending and shaking like a branch in a storm. She wanted to yell, but couldn't. Jolenta set the baby on the floor, then turned back to Coventina. She shook her again and again until there was no doubt she was dead. Jolenta had seen plenty of dead animals. Her mom looked the same. She dropped to her knees and rocked back and forth. No, no, she called out. I left. I walked out on you when you needed me. It's my fault. You must have thought I was gone forever. I... Then she noticed a red line around her mother's neck. It was straight across, a mixture of bruises and places where something thin had cut through her skin. Jolenta looked up from her mother's body and glanced around the room. There didn't appear to be a bloody rope nearby, but whoever did this might have taken it with him. She noticed the crying baby again, the one by her feet. She picked up the little girl and brought her back to the other three screaming infants. They needed to eat, or there would be more deaths on her conscience. Jolenta grows up to be a strong woman who helps the victims of church abuse with a system that is like a medieval underground railroad. The story takes place in a hard time, filled with violence and suffering, but also with characters capable of great love.